thank you for that. And apologies for reorienting the order of events. I had presented some theatre, but I think for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to utilize it. I'm going to attempt to deliver a message without using the crutch, again, just for the sake of efficiency. So I'm supposed to talk to you a little bit about the macroeconomy globally, maybe here through Africa, if that matters at all, and a little bit about South Africa. I think it's safe to say that you and your world have safely impregnated the idea that the type of economic experience that the world is undergoing right now is unprecedented in a really great length of time, for a hundred years. And if you didn't read the media last week, it would have been hard almost even over the weekend to dismiss the idea that we are in a post-bubble environment. In other words, the global shakeout of 2009 and a little bit of 2010 is going to rever reverberate for some while. And what we refer to is the extent of economic smash that the world experienced over the period that I've mentioned is of such magnitude that its economic consequences, the social dimension, is going to be lingering for some time still. And if we doubt the enormity of that economic experience, I mean, it's safe to consider that more than 40 million people around the planet safely lost their formal sector jobs, and many millions more found themselves in insecure space, insecure about the length of journey that they will have in their current jobs, income security, and whether someone in their home may lose their job. And as a consequence of that security, there was economic fallback or withdrawal in terms of economic participation, and that in, on its own created an indirect weakness in the economy around the planet. So last week we were reminded that the world is still pretty fragile. Arguably, the single most important metric that matters to everybody around the planet is U.S. payrolls. U.S. payrolls matter quite simply because we know the U.S. economy still accounts for a very sizable chunk of world GDP, roughly one-fifth. But even more than just postulating and asserting that the U.S. matters for its weight in global production and its global income, one of the great miscalculations, amongst a few others, that economists made during the Great Recession of 08, 09, and 10, a little bit of that, was what we called network externalities just simply a technical word that loosely may be interpreted as globalization. What we fell to under what we fell to under under what we fell to appreciate quite, quite fully was quite simply the manner in which the world had become wired. Wired in terms of trade, investment flows, even diaspora flows. The manner in which capital emanate from one corner of the globe, flows to another and impacts on the prices of credit in that particular market. So that when the world ruptured out of subprime housing in the United States, that filtered into the financial sector in the United States. It trampled on the credit markets in that economy. And so Sam chose not to go to Walmart anymore and purchase product, which of course tainted that manufacturer in China who was producing trinkets and toys and shipping it to Walmart, and of course with diminished production in that Chinese manufacturer in the Guangdong province. That then impacted on that capital equipment manufacturer in Japan, who was supplying this heavy-duty hydraulic equipment for that Chinese manufacturer. And of course, with diminished materials demand in Japan, and also in China itself, that impacted on that Zambian copper supply or Nigerian energy exporter, or maybe even that paper and pulp producer in Ghana. And so seemingly something that happened in a very remote part of the world, remote in terms of not the location, but subprime housing, began to manifest itself quite significantly, potently, in every cranny and nook in the economy. And in the same way as the US exported its risks in the housing market, Today, we worry about US payrolls and the capacity.
capacity for the U.S. economy to generate jobs. And now for two consecutive months, the U.S. economy has shown that, in fact, that employment creating energy is proving to be subpar. And the type of, or the quantity of jobs, as well as the quality of jobs that it's creating, is shallower than what the market or the clever economists seemingly have anticipated. The rather very significant statistic emanates from the East Chinese inflation. It has risen from very low single digits to around 6%. Inflation is a fairly significant threat in China because it erodes consumer purchasing power. The glue that holds the Chinese economy together is the idea that over the last two decades, no other economy with such pace, such breadth, so prolifically has been able to create and bring into its middle class fold so many people, so many people in such a short space of time. But the deficit remains huge, and social harmony is not just a conduit or a transition or a transitionary element of public policy, but is a long-term goal. And inflation not only directly erodes consumer purchasing power, it saps real incomes. But inflation also creates distortions in the economy. And the Chinese authorities have for some while now been attempting to cool the economy so as to stymie further inflation. It has also been attempting to cool its economy to create lower inflation, for example, in real estate prices. So when we talk about inflation, we tend to think about it in the prices of goods and services. We tend to think, of, think about it in terms of Mr. Price, thick and pay. We tend to think a little less about it in terms of house prices. And asset prices, particularly real estate, has also been rising quite noticeably. And that inflation has been also <coughs> somewhat problematic. Perhaps the third realm of statistics that has been of great import to the planet has been related to Europe. Europe's public finances, we appreciate, it, are fairly precarious. Not just Europe, the United States too. In fact, one would argue that they are both two sides of the same fiscal crisis coin. But for the moment, let's just focus on Europe. And Europe's travails relates to bad public finances on the periphery. And when we say periphery, we, as you will know, mean Portugal, Ireland. It's kind of talking within the Southern African con context or the South Africa context of Botswana, maybe Lesotho, maybe Swaziland. Somewhat less disturbing to the core. At the tail of this, of last week, we very quickly realized that um, spreads or risk gauges related to Italy rose fairly noticeably. So it's not just the periphery, but the core that is now signaling unsustainable public finances. And as you will be aware, Italy is the third largest economy in the Eurozone region, after Germany and France. And with illness now focusing or bleeding more potently towards the center, the Eurorand's economy is becoming further stymied. And weak performance there is seemingly quite likely for a while still. Now, Europe matters again in the same way that I've argued America matters, in the sense that Europe accounts for a little less than one fifth of world GDP. It's also a fairly significant consumer of resources from other parts of the world. It isn't as open as the US economy in terms of trade and investment flows, but it is an open economy to some degree. And of course, with the United States and Europe combined, now <coughs> for, as I've argued, roughly 45% of the world's GDP, production, income, with it in such a precarious position quite clearly, it suggests over the short to medium term, global growth is likely to be sub -par. Maybe just to bring the economic argument to conclusion so I can leave it open for questions, I thought that was the more, that's likely to be the more interesting part. For the last 25 years or so, in you know, principally in the 1990s, the global economy found enormous traction. And one can argue that it was an era of, of peace, the end of the Cold War, end of the Iraq, Middle Eastern tensions, and peace brings its own growth dividend. And resources were shifted from 
guns to butter. Public finances were allocated towards more constructive endeavor in the developed markets. And that gave traction to a more substantial and wholesome global economic growth paradigm. It filtered into the naughty for the 2000s decade. And the 2000s, again, were an incredibly benign period for growth, at least superficially. I would argue that the 2000s was also an era where one can safely say never before have so many people benefited by so much and in such a short period of time. And never before have so many of those beneficiaries been in emerging markets. So, you know, BRICS is a concept that was born in the early 2000s. But it's not just to confine to the BRIC nations that having enjoyed so much rise in, in prominence in economic power and also in a thickening middle class, <coughs> so a bunch of other emerging markets. But of course today we're having to now marry the opportunity and the emergence of the East and South against enormous cyclical volatility. The fluctuations in the United States, I've spoken to you about, Europe to China, the epicenter of growth in Asia, and the beachhead for emerging markets generally also seemingly close to some sort of volatility as they attempt to lessen their dependence on external demand and increase their capacity to pro provide in domestic growth stimulus. <coughs> Africa, of course, grew spiritedly in 2000. It grew by an average 6% per year for the period, at least 2000 to 2008. Growth then slumped to around 2% in 2009, and this time it's been different, because Africa's been able to sprint out of that low 2% growth in 2009, and is likely to do, for example, maybe 55 maybe 6% growth this year. Never before has Africa been able to accelerate out of a downturn quicker than developed economies. It's the first time in more than 50 years that Africa has been able to sprint. And it speaks to Africa's far more sounder, generally speaking, macroeconomic fundamentals. South Africa is a laggard. It is not likely that we will do better than 3.5, you know, maybe 3.6, maybe 3.7 percent this year. That's about half what the rest of the continent is doing. So we seem to be hamstrung. Um, maybe I'll just pause then and say, I guess, Journalism needs to understand exactly where we are in the cycle as distinct from the secular performance over the last 10 or 15 years. There's a level of language that we need to appreciate and understand so as to appropriately articulate exactly the fragility of the global economy and how we interpret it. When I say the language, I refer, for example, to the technical stuff credit default swaps, spreads, what they imply, appreciating what are the core metrics that really matter. I highlighted US payroll. The head of home loans visited me a couple of weeks ago and, and we were talking about that the home loan book. I mentioned her because you know it's the biggest book in our retail lending space. And home loans is singularly the largest exposure that any household will have in terms of its nominal quantum of debt. And I said to her, you know, mind the payrolls. If you do nothing else, Fineka, just look at payrolls. It matters so much for how South Africans will be able to service their debt. And you know, after lunch on Friday, um, she sent me an SMS and she's asked, should we be panicking now? It's simply because the payroll number was so poor, stock markets around the world fell over, credit spreads widened. I said, it's too late, we should have planned it on Thursday. <laughs> um, but the point is she understood, understands quite simply you know, how she prices that loan to that individual coming from Tokoza, wanting to buy a house, matters so much um, in terms of what the signals from payrolls uh, mean for the rest of the planet, even though connecting it is slightly, slightly different. 